Turin school and say, look, you're going to have to make some excuse up for me because no way can we get that today. <laughs> well, we wonder. Hello and welcome. This is episode 20 and the grand finale of the main series of the Paul Ryder Tapes. I'm Angela Smith. I'm the ex-wife of Paul, founding member and bassist with Happy Mondays, as well as being a singer in his side project Big Arm and a musician in several other groups. This all began after I played Paul the pilot episode of another podcast that I'd made, which gave us the idea of doing a podcast together for him to tell his complete life story, not just the successes, but the struggles too. A book, a new album of previously unreleased solo material would follow. Paul was excited about this project and he hoped that in sharing his experiences it would help some people who might be going through similar difficulties. Neither of us had any idea that 12 days after we would finish recording his story that he'd be dead. You've sat with us, you've laughed with us, you've cried with us and shared in the journey of his incredible life and heard him confess to some pretty shocking things. But there's much more in this final episode of the main series coming up. The window was open and I crept up behind you and grabbed the phone off you. Mm, I totally And this. saw this text thread conversation with you and this woman. Oh. It was obviously there was something going on between you, so I called her. We met Ronnie Biggs, uh, great show. Well, it's nice to meet somebody who plays such a... Uh, no, an historical moment in British history. And uh, yeah, we met Piers Morgan, yeah, yeah. Who actually said I spiked his burger. So it was like me and you and your new partner and her ex-husband yeah. <laughs> and their kids all yeah. around the Christmas dinner table. Yeah. Before drugs and everything, I didn't. I was more of a beer monster and they, they disappeared. And I wondered why they're coming back happy. What are they doing? I was smoking weed, weren't they? they? didn't tell me about it. The other project that you're doing in collaboration with Gaz is a movie. It's the movie. <laughs> the movie. So it's about a Manchester band who existed 25 years ago and they're offered this uh, great chance to get back together. Right. With, um, but with a uh, unsavoury type manager. <laughs> <laughs> If you find it and put it back on, but no, it doesn't work like that. If you find it and put it back on, it's too late. You definitely get yourself tested for everything. First, we're going to go back in time to a story that's so iconic that we saved it for the last episode in this run. I'm just going to say three words. Brazil, February 1991. We're going back in time here, but we never talked about Brazil. The Ronnie Biggs. Oh, yeah, yeah, Talk yeah. to us about that. Um, yeah, we played this festival in Brazil, Rock in Rio. For me, that was the... The, the Mondays at the maddest, you know what I mean? We had such a great time playing in front of them. And we caused... We were in the hotel with Guns N' Roses. And all that's actually caused fucking chaos. Like, you won't believe how fucking mad we was, you know what I mean? Like, there's no words could describe it. And we was actually putting a whole cell with Guns N' Roses away from all the other acts, because we were deemed as the two mad rock and roll bands. And Guns N' Roses were quite, no, they're rock and roll, but in like a proper rock and roll American way, you know what I mean? They look like your yeah. fucking typical rock stars, where we look like just a bunch of fucking, like, no some knobheads from somewhere, you know what I mean? <laughs> What's the most memorable gig that you've played? Like, is there one that sticks in your mind as being particularly <coughs> mind-blowing for you? I was probably... Um, it would probably have to be in Brazil um, because we were put on last 
because of some technical error because there was a thunderstorm and um, I think you know you've got Guns N' Roses you've got Wham and you've got Piers Morgan on the plane and he was watching us and um, I did this gig and then it pissed down didn't it typical Manchester weather and there's 150,000 people in the pissing rain and then they all started leaving and all of a sudden they all started coming back and it was they were getting into it. It was like, at first they didn't, oh, who's this lot? Never heard of them before. They start leaving. Then the cat started coming back because they saw what was going on and it was a really fantastic gig. Did you interact with Guns N' Roses? Uh, we said hello, we said hello to him. I've actually uh, said hello quite a few times to him in, in, over the years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But we didn't really hang out in, in any sort no. of way. I don't think we was cool enough for him. Or maybe they weren't cool enough for you. <laughs> yeah. And we got um, invited up to Ronnie Biggs's house with Piers Morgan, who was working for the Sun at the time. We did, yeah, we met Ronnie Biggs, a uh, great show. Well, it was nice to meet somebody who plays such a, uh, you know, an historical moment in British history. Paul's friend Dave was struck by how nonchalantly Paul had mentioned this escapade to him a short time after. He said we went up there and uh, uh, we just uh, we just went to meet him and, and you know sit by his pool and he just ended up staying there for ages and then he went on to the you know the next bit of conversation about how he likes Holt's beer and everything but this was it you didn't know you didn't know whether he was going to talk about um, you know uh, loving fried eggs needing to go and uh, and, and uh, get some money for some cigarettes or sitting by a swimming pool with Ronnie Biggs or having a laugh with Roy Wood and I think that that was. You know, the, the sort of enduring memory about Paul is that uh, it was just this kaleidoscope of, you know, seemingly random, but all, I've no doubt, all dead true. It was great meeting Ronnie Biggs. Um, and he, he also said, you're the best band that has ever visited, because a lot of people go and see him, or went to see him, and he, he enjoyed our company. <laughs> so we got on really well with him, yeah. What did he talk about? His poetry, wow. his escape. His escape from prison, his life in Brazil. He was really open and, and like quite quite good to talk to. Did you stay in touch with him afterwards? No, I think Moza did, who was our tour manager at the time. Stayed in touch with Mikey, his son, right. who was a child pop star in Brazil. Really? He had lots of gold and platinum discs all over his, his walls. Tell me about Rio. <laughs> Rio was just wild. We, we went... Uh... We went, fucking you know, I have to take my own okay, So, when we get to Rio, I'm fucking want to start with this one. Piers Morgan did the bizarre column um, at the time in the sun. So the sun took us over. It was saying, even though we were going over for Rock in Rio, they, he took us to Ronnie Biggs's house for the day. Um, and it was brilliant. I sat with Ronnie Biggs's son for a long time. He was only 16. But yeah, no, we had the best time rocking me because the guitars didn't turn up on time. So we ended up getting there for a couple of days. But yeah, it was a day, it was a day out with Ronnie Biggs um, at Ronnie Biggs's house. It was fantastic. And yeah, Bez was making the burgers, is what um, Piers Morgan says, and spiked him. <laughs> so a, that's what Piers Morgan says. He was, he was dancing like a, a hippie something for hours, eight hours. <laughs> Well, he thinks Bez spiked him. He said, I don't know what Bez put in those burgers, but I was dancing like a something for eight hours. Yeah, right, right. yeah I, don't, I don't remember Bez being in charge of any burgers. I don't think anybody was hungry. Piers Morgan, yeah, yeah. I actually said I spiked his burger, but I, I never did, you know what I mean? But I did smoke stiff an ounce of coke on the plane next to him on the way home, and he pretended to be asleep all the way. And I was under a blanket like that, me and Paul Davis. Yeah, but uh, I suppose that's a story you shouldn't be telling, really. <laughs> no, five pound a gram, though, the coat was. It was very strong. So we were all, we were all struggling <laughs> to get it down us. There's an infamous story in Brazil <laughs> about, about some ladies of the night. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us that story? The truth. The truth. <laughs> that one's actually true. Rio was just wild. We, Sean's got this bird and... Uh, got this little groupy bird, and so we're all out of the was doing it. Bez is after his nut. We're all off the nut, but I don't take coke then. Uh, I put everyone's on it, so we go to this club called Out with Rowetta. It's 20 odd of us. They've got 18 prostitutes come back. Everyone's got up. Gaz and uh, Mark Day, they was just like invisible because there was just so much going on. They were so quiet. 
go yeah. to the room and lock the room door where there's fucking chaos. <laughs> Telly's over the balcony. I'm fighting with Guns N' Roses because he's Nick Sean's bird. Uh, Axel, Axel Rose, and I said, put it on him. He says something to me, and Sean's going, Yeah, he'll fucking, he'll batter you. So I said to me, You'll fucking batter me. I'm going, I'm fucking hell. I'm walking around, and we're running bigs with me, the, the, the old train robber who's my idol. Uh, he's in my room, starting his brains off, and I'm thinking. So we goes back to the club called out. Oh, Rowetta's getting threatened because there's 2,000 prostitutes in there, and they think Rowetta's stepping on, her, on the toes. So these what a battery went oh Sean's saying yeah, yeah fuck it nah, 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 nah. And, but these girls fucking gorgeous hands and they even think I'm they're kissing you and they're touching you and and you've never done anything like it's like a ten handed massage, your hands are down your pants <laughs> and getting strokes and looking and saying they love me and thinking fucking hell she loves me and fucking she's a prostitute I'm going fucking hell. It was swarming with them at the hotel, Slash was in the pool. Um, Bez had to get $50 off me to get rid of his because she, she wouldn't leave the day after. He said, I'll buy you a handbag. I was like, I don't want a handbag. He's like, you had to try and get rid of his. Um, he was with us. He lost a condom or piss. And he said, he rang me from his, from his room phone and went, if you find it and put it back on. Went, no, it doesn't work like that. If you find it and put it back on, it's too late. You definitely get yourself tested for everything. The only dead it, Mark Day, and Gaz didn't take a bird back. All the crew, every one of us. Paul's got two, Sean's got two, Bez has got four. People had paid this girl who was a lady of the night and she ended up in my room falling asleep. So I took the money back out of her purse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was a good idea because we, we could have got thrown in jail actually. Really? For robbing her, it was a robbery. <laughs> we ended up giving it her back in the morning because we was like, shit, shouldn't have done that. She'll go to the police. Anyway, in the morning, I've, I've gone to get them up. Sean, they want them paying. Manager shut me down. The police today, it's quite heavy. So I've got to pay these prostitutes and the police today. So I paid the police some of And these prostitutes, we can't even stand up, but the skirts are hanging off, the bras are not on. The hotel manager's going mad to try to get them out to dress them up. Um, so I paid them all, gone upstairs. I said, What the fuck is going on? And they just saw something, they was laughing like this. And then on the way back on the plane, all the crew was at the back. Me and Sean was in first class because Piers Morgan was doing an interview with Sean. And uh, they had blankets at the back because on them days we could smoke weed and everything. Oh, we did smoke weed, not any cover, we just fucking when the plane's in the air, we're smoking, snorting. So I watched the back of the plane and there was just blankets like tents and all you could hear was everyone snorting and there was why we got our fans, there was all police waiting for us. They've opened the door, there's just a line of police I'm thinking, oh fuck, everyone's getting nicked, they've gone, you over there to me, Sean, you over there. They snorted from Rio to London right? and then when we get next, we've got half an hour left there having bigger lines and but it's a blanket of fucking, they put the blankets all over the, they've made tents. Now, and underneath, everyone's just having lines and smoking weed. We believe they've been taking cocaine. I said, mate, it's all gone. And they've gone, what? So he's fucking finished. They ain't smuggling now. We don't smuggle. We just fucking take it. <laughs> but yeah, it was true. Wow. <laughs> OK, rock and roll. Yeah, I was at his house one time and um, uh, he, was, uh, he said, just a minute, he's on the phone and everything. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, then. And uh, put the phone down. I said, who was that? And he goes, oh, it's uh, Robbie Williams. And you um, did just in passing, you know, and, and whereas any one of these little things to, to you know, to, to, to people who are not in that world seem like a big deal. Mm. And, but they were, I don't know, I think so many people liked Paul because he, he, he was just, he was, he was just nice. You know what I mean? Just nice. And I think, you know, you know more than anyone, you know, it's nice. So we left off the last episode as Paul was saying that he was glad that his cheating days were over. All that sneaking around is not good for your soul. No. No. What do you think motivates people? To do it? Yeah. Um, a variety of different reasons. Like I said, mine was sex addiction. All that sneaking around. It's like getting a high off it. You actually enjoy getting away with it? I must do, yeah. Yeah. I remember you got very um, accusatory of me. Oh. Like I'd come back late from something. You've been with another man. I think that's normal when somebody's cheating. Yeah, they, they project, project it onto project the it. partner, don't yeah. they? But then you could also argue that infidelity is... There's a reason for it. Like if you're really happy in your relationship, then 
it surely doesn't cross your mind, does it? Not with this relationship I'm in now. It's never crossed my mind. Right. Exactly. That's that's yeah. my point. So what I'm trying to say is that it's not necessarily just one person's fault. Mm. Like that, that it comes as a result of something being wrong in the relationship, and yeah. and that's about two people and what two people are bringing to the table. I'm trying to give you a bit of a break here. I know. I know. No, but you, obviously Mate, there was something wrong. There was the thing that was wrong was me with with the addiction. I couldn't get clean and stay clean. Right. That was the big thing. Yeah. And I was beating myself up every time I relapsed. Right. Which doesn't leave me in a good headspace, hence three years in the back bedroom. Right. Depressed as hell. Right. So then you see, like, another woman, uh, something else to think about. Is it like a distraction? Yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to give you excuses here at all, but I'm just trying to look at it from your point of view, Mm -hmm. from your side of the table. It, just to change the way you feel. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a drug. You do it to change the way you feel. Yeah. Does it work though? For a minute. Yeah. Like shopping works for a minute. Right. I went through my shopping addiction did. phase, didn't I? You did. Talk about that. Love shopping. Still love shopping now. Mm-hmm. But I, could, I don't have to buy everything I see. Right. That's the difference these days. I know I don't have to buy stuff. But right. I do enjoy looking around at clothes, in clothes stores. Yeah, but you don't look around and not buy anything. I have done. Yeah? Yeah, it's been known. If they've not got your size. <laughs> no, I've put stuff back that I would have bought in the past, I would have bought. Yeah. Just to buy. Yeah. Mm. Paul's love of shopping, particularly for clothes, seems to have come from his dad's side of the family. Derek's mother worked at Truly Fair where they made all these children's clothes for Lewis's oh, yeah. and Kendall's Truly and Fair. abroad. Yeah. Yeah. And she used to buy them the most beautiful things. But the night, the, the winter she bought them tights. I really, <laughs> really, oh. the, key, the little leggies warm oh, under I the know, pants. It's a bit of a problem, and, isn't it? Uh, well, Paul looked like a girl. He really did. Nobody knew he was a boy. Yeah, I can see that Paul... Nobody knew he was a boy. He looked like a girl. Well, the clothes she bought, Sean, was all right. But she used to buy these little winter suits for Paul with little swans down fur around him. (laughs) She She wanted a girl, didn't she? she, Yeah, all the clothes she bought him was all girly clothes. Yeah. And I couldn't put them in him unless she was coming. And by all accounts, his dad, Derek, was a snappy dresser back in the day. Oh, when I first went out with him, oh, my God, my mother said, oh, it's very nice, but you can do better than that. Why doesn't he get a nice haircut? Why doesn't he wear a nice suit? And I said, well, he is a nice boy, Mum. He's just different. And I I always said I wanted somebody different. I didn't want the run of the mill. And my goodness, did I get somebody different and children that were different. And one of Paul's shopping partners was Rowetta. He was addicted to shopping for jackets and shoes, especially because we used to go to a place called Brunswick where shoes were half priced. And we used there was one near me and there was one in Regent Road and nobody really knew about it. And we just, we'd spend hundreds of pounds on millions of shoes. Because they were just, they were, sometimes they were eight quid for a pair of shoes. And uh, he liked his Converse and we had, Paul used to love his coats, didn't he? His leathers and stuff. And they, a lot of them, yeah. they just looked the same. But he'd go and buy them again and again and again. So the last affair. I mean, it's kind of funny when we look back on the last one. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was... <laughs> it was like an Ealing comedy. <laughs> At the end. It was, it was. There were three occasions where I caught you and the third occasion was the end of the marriage but the first occasion was you'd gone out to a meeting and you came back and you were sitting in the car on your phone Mm. and I crept and the window was open and I crept up behind you and grabbed the phone off you Mm. 
I don't remember And saw this, this text thread <laughs> conversation with you and this woman. Oh. It was obviously there was something going on between you, so I called her. Oh. Do you not remember this? No. I remember where I was in the house, and I had a conversation with her, and she was really rude to me on the phone. I was like, why are you texting my husband and saying that you can't wait to see him tomorrow? Oh. Uh, and uh, so I was like, there's nothing going on, we're just friends. She was huh. very posh. <laughs> um, we're just friends, there's nothing going on. Mm. And I was like, and I, you know when you, you get mad and all the moisture from your mouth vanishes? Mm -hmm. I was fuming and I was like, you keep away from my... It was like a proper like uh -huh. <laughs> fishwife type conversation. <laughs> Um, but she wasn't nice. I didn't like the sound of this woman at all. And, of course, you completely denied there was anything going on. So that was at incident number one. So mm. I knew my antenna were then up. Mm. And they must have been up in the first place for me to grab the phone off you in the car. Yeah. And then um, you, you didn't know that if I had your Apple ID and password that I could, tra I could track you with Find My iPhone. Mm. So one day, a couple of weeks later, you said you weren't going to see her anymore and you weren't even going to be friends with her anymore. And then uh, you said you were somewhere and I checked find my iPhone and you <laughs> weren't where you said you were. You were actually I dropped a, the ball on that you one, did. didn't I? You absolutely dropped the ball. And you were in a car park in Malibu outside a supermarket. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I drive down to you and you're in the car with this woman and I went storming up. Uh -huh. and caught you in the car. You were just sitting in the car talking. But the fishwife in me came out. And again, <laughs> my mouth was completely dry and I was hoarse. And I was shouting at this woman in this car park. And a crowd <laughs> a crowd gathered. Really? And all the, the interesting thing was, all of my anger was directed towards her and not you. Mm. Like, why wasn't I shouting at you? I was shouting at her. And it was because she'd been rude to me on the phone earlier and said there was nothing going on. You, you need therapy over this. I think I've, had, I, I think I've, dealt, I think I've dealt with it. Oh, I think, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good about it, aren't I? Yeah. I can laugh about it. And then um, I don't know how it didn't resolve. You came home and still professed that there was nothing going on. And then about a couple of weeks after that, um, again, find my iPhone. You said you were in one place, but you weren't. You were, you were in Malibu. So I drove my car to where he was in Malibu on the Pacific Coast Highway. And I'm going to pause the conversation there and play a chunk of that other podcast that I did that I mentioned earlier that was actually the inspiration for this one. You see, after I split with Paul, I went on all kinds of outlandish dates <laughs> and I decided to do a podcast about dating in your 50s. And as I talked about our marriage breakup, I decided that I should really play Paul that episode. <laughs> and it was him listening to that episode that led to the idea of us doing this podcast. So anyway, here's a clip from the other podcast. It's called Accidentally Milf. And this is the dramatic reconstruction of our marriage breakup car chase. Nowadays, it's all gone. Okay, so the adventures began a few years ago on a balmy April night in Malibu. I was suspicious that my husband was having an affair, but he kept denying it. And on one particular Saturday night, he told me he was in one place, but the Find My iPhone app told me differently. So, of course, I drove to find him and see for myself exactly what was going on. I caught up with him in our car, which was pulled into a gas station in Malibu, mid-clinch with his horrible mistress who I love to call leather lips <laughs> come on I'm allowed one little catty dig aren't I she was having an affair with my husband after all come on give me a bit of a break here okay so he spotted me and him and leather lips took off down the Pacific Coast Highway and I sped after them in my battered old PT cruiser the Pacific Ocean was on the right the sun was setting it was like a perfect picture postcard backdrop to be having a marriage breakup car chair. I honestly felt like I was in an episode of something like Starsky and Hutch. <laughs> 
I knew it was dangerous, please don't copy me, but my adrenaline took over, like my heart was absolutely pounding in my chest. I was absolutely fuming and my mouth was completely dry. I've no idea why, but eventually, after probably, I don't know, a couple of minutes of racing down that street, they finally gave up and pulled in. And I jumped out of my car. Do you know what? My heart is pounding as I'm actually telling you this. So I jumped out of the car and other cars and trucks were speeding past me. It was, it was really lucky that I didn't get knocked down and I honestly felt like time had stood still and all of my movements and words were out of body like I was being controlled by somebody else up above. Like I really didn't feel I had any kind of control over what was to happen next. So that's from the podcast Accidentally MILF Online Dating Adventures After 50, which was the podcast that inspired this one. So please go and check it out on all the usual podcast platforms. Yeah, I remember the car chase. It was like a movie. It was like the opening scene of a movie. Yeah. Chasing down the PCH. And I don't know why, but eventually you pulled in. What What made you pull in? Why did you stop? Why didn't you just carry on driving? There was no point, was there? <laughs> You're like, fair cop, go. Yeah. <laughs> and then point. I got out of my car. Why didn't you take off when I got out of my car? You'd have had a head start. You could have got away. I'm tired of running. Did you want to be caught? No, I don't know. I don't think so. No, that's horrible. No, I didn't want to be caught. But you just accepted that you had been caught? Yeah. And I said, roll down the window, and you did. Like, why did you do that? I've, I've not really... And again... ...analysed this. And I said to you, right, make a choice, her or me. And you said, do you remember what you said? Mm -mm. I just want to be on my own. Mm. And I said, oh, I'll help you pack. Oh. Do you remember that? And dramatic then, ending. Yeah, and then I drove home, and then you appeared back home. I couldn't believe you actually came back. And then the next morning, I helped you pack your stuff, mm. and you left. Oh, yeah. And Vlad was there. My mate Vlad, who was staying with us at the time, had a ringside seat. <laughs> <laughs> and then I you, think you was glad to get rid of me, actually. You know, it took me about two weeks. I was devastated for about two weeks, and then one morning I woke up, and I was like, oh, don't have to worry about him anymore. Mm. And I felt a huge weight there had lifted go. off my shoulders. Good. Yeah, I really did. I was really kind of elated that mm. I didn't have to deal with all that crap anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the best thing about it was that eventually you did break up with this woman. Yeah. And um, um, I think if you'd still been with this woman, I don't think I would have been able to be friends friends with you. <laughs> Likewise. No, but it's true. Um, so we spent about a year fighting, really, over you kept coming back to the house and demanding paintings that were yours, and we were we had a tug of love of some... Who, who did the paintings? Who Henry Hill. Henry Hill paintings, that's right. Mm -hmm. So I think we d we decided to split them. And you you took some and I took some, mm -hmm. but I don't remember arguing about anything else. Do you? No, I just wanted my Henry Hill paintings. Yeah. Oh, and I, I sold you jukebox. <laughs> and my space invader machine. It was worth there about was, two grand. There was no room for it though in the new house because I had to. We, I, we then we, I was given notice from the house that we were living in. Actually, where's the little green motorbike? It's in the garage. Oh no, it's down the side of the house. It's mine that. <laughs> But we sold the other... Mo well, we didn't have any money either. Like, mm. we were really struggling because mm -hmm. since Chico had been sick, I hadn't worked. Yeah. So, like, finances were really tight. And I think that was one of the reasons that you were pushed over the edge because, like, financially, things were really, really dire mm -hmm. at that point. And I think that woman had quite a lot of money, didn't she? I don't she know. She had to have had something. I don't know. Yeah, she did. You know she did. Anyway, so then... <laughs> so we had about a year where we didn't really get on very well mm -hmm. and then we started talking again and you had broken up with her and you had had to move out of where you were staying so you'd become friends with Andy Dick through mm. various meetings that you used to go to tell me about him and your friendship with him I met him at one of them self-help groups yeah um, over our Common love for Converse, the shoe. Oh, okay. 
You know, I had lots of pairs, different colours, and so did he. And um, just became mates with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, we was mates for like two, two and a half. I'm still mates now. Yeah, I remember the but, night that we, the day we broke up. You mm. went to stay with him in his halfway house where he was staying. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. In Malibu. Yeah. Yeah, he put me up. Yeah, for people in England that don't know much about Andy Dick, just tell tell us who he is. He's a, an actor, comedian, um, uh, improv. He does a lot of improv. Um, he's been in quite a few movies. Yeah. He's been in The Simpsons. Yeah, I think it's safe to say if he hadn't got the issues that he has with alcohol, he would be a huge superstar at this point. Yeah, because he is a comedy genius isn't yeah, he very much really so. clever really funny yeah yeah but if he hadn't continued with his problems then he would have mm. been uh, mm -hmm. up there again mm. like he was when he was 25 yeah and he had bouts with sobriety because that's when you met him when he was sober yeah and uh, one day you said to me Andy wants to meet you because you're a producer and he wants to do stuff so you said, "Come, I'm staying with him." When you'd broken up with that woman, you went again. You went to stay with Andy, mm -hmm. who was then staying with his then wife, but they weren't actually together. No. But they were still friends. Yeah. Uh, so he was living in a house with her and her kids, mm -hmm. and you were sleeping on the sofa there because you'd not got anywhere else to go. That's right. And you invited me round to the house to meet Andy to talk about what projects maybe we'd want to do together. Mm -hmm. And it was really nice. We had a really good. Like a good few hours chatting about stuff, and we came up with an idea, and mm -hmm. and it was a really positive, um, a positive experience. And I met his then wife briefly, and then um, New Order were playing about two months later. And I remember saying to you, "Can you get me some tickets for New Order? I want to go." And you said, oh, "I'll see what I can do." And then you were like, "Oh, I could only get two tickets, and I'm and I'm taking Lena." and his wife just to say thank you for me staying there <laughs> I was like oh yeah <laughs> and I think that was was that the start of your relationship it tell was. me about that that was it that was the first date yeah was it officially a date or <clears throat> it was by the end of the night so how, when did you decide that you liked her like what what was the first oh weeks before yeah yeah she's just a lovely person didn't you see her when you were out with Andy one night and said, who's she? Yeah, that was before I moved. That was bef before I moved into that house with them. Mm. Um, he was doing a, a show in Santa Monica, a stand-up, and I was playing bass on stage, just playing the bass while he's doing his monologues and stuff. Right. And she was there helping him put the night on. Yeah. And I said to him, who's the girl with the short hair? And he's like, that's my, that's my baby mama. She's available. <laughs> so he put the thought into my head months before. Yeah. And then I ended up staying with them. Yeah. And it went from there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So very shortly after that, Christmas came around. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the boys for Christmas. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you called me on Christmas morning and you said, what are you doing for Christmas? And I was like, oh, I've just got the boys here. And you're like, can we come well? <laughs> Tell me about that day. Who ended up coming? So everybody came. There was me, Lena. So there was like me and you and your new partner and her ex-husband yeah. <laughs> and their kids yeah. all around the Christmas dinner table. Yeah. Which was actually really cool, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a really good day. Yeah. People still talk about that Christmas dinner. Do they? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm not the world's best cook. I'm really not the world's best cook. I don't have a love for cooking whatsoever. I know. But it was good. <laughs> but it was good, that dinner, wasn't it? And, it was and, a good and dinner. And Andy didn't believe that I'd actually made it. Yeah, it was a good dinner. Yeah. Yeah, I, need, I do know you're not a really good cook. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I'm not... It's just that I'm not interested in doing it. Like, yeah. I, I don't get pleasure from... Preparing something for three hours that takes ten minutes to then consume by everybody. <laughs> I don't get that cooking thing. I've never had that gene in me. I mean, I like eating food, but it's just that preparation just feels like... Some people like it. A waste of time. Some yeah. people don't. So tell us a little bit about what life is like now for mm. Paul Ryder in the present day. Um, well... I consider myself 
semi-retired right. and um, I have lots of downtime away from the music business mm -hmm. and uh, I just relax and take it easy. Yeah, do you feel like you've earned the right to do that? To put my feet up, yeah, definitely. It's yeah. been 40 years. Really? Since we first started, me and our kid, yeah. Wow. 40 years this year. Did you have any idea when you first started the band that 40 years later you'd be doing a podcast talking about no. it? They didn't even exist back then, did they? No. Um, obviously, I wanted to make it last as long as possible. But 40 years is like a big stretch, isn't it? You mm -hmm. know, from from the conception of it until today, doing a podcast. Yeah. 40 years is a long time. Why do you think the band has had such longevity? Mm, originality. Right. Just because we was original. The music was original, the band was original, and genuine, real. Okay, but you were original 40 years ago, but what's kept the interest, do you think, of the fans all those years? I must, I can only presume it's the music, good music. The Mondays inspired me no end. I was like, every time I went seeing an Happy Mondays gig, I literally was like down for the next two days because I just thought, we, we can't do what they're doing, we can't be that good. They're, they're, they're another level, they're otherworldly, you know what I mean? And I'd come away and literally just beating myself up about how shit we were. In a lot of ways, sometimes it'd be like, you'd wish you was in the Happy Mondays and not in the Stone Roses, in, in, in a weird kind of way, you know. It, it just, it, 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 it appealed to me a lot there, the, the look of him and the, like, the bastardised funk that they were trying to, uh, trying to knock together and stuff like that. And uh, you can, and on the art, you can say there was never any kind of rivalry ever in Manchester. We always like got a like house on fire, and there was a, a mutual respect right there from the get go, you know. And then it took me a couple of days for people to say, "No, you're not. You're great. You're good." I'm like, "Are you sure? Are we good? I'll give it another go then." You have these great bands in Manchester that changed Manchester, they changed England, they changed the world. I didn't analyse what he did. I just knew he did what he did well, just like the rest of us, and he fitted in well, just mm -hmm. like the he did, and it was just cool, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it, it, it's, it was funny because uh, I suppose, it, if anything, the Mondays music has been spoiled for me by our closeness. Right. You know, I never got to judge them from a distance because mm. I was always so involved with them right from the start. Mm. So whether it was emotionally or anything like that, it, it, I was never able to uh, listen to them in any way, shape or form from a, um, a, a, an unbiased point of view. Mm. They were always my Happy Mondays. Mm. And they were always factory bands, so we were always very clammy. We were always very close, mm. and it was us against the world. Yeah. Paul and Bez's friendship stretches right back to the very early days when Paul passed a loyalty test after they got into a bit of a scrape. In the early days, we, none of us had a carrot, you know what I mean? And uh, Paul used to run the car. I don't know how he did on it, but it, it was never even uh, to the edge of MC. It was always half... Half down the MC, you know what I mean? And that car, it, it seems to run like magic, you know what I mean? On thin air, it used to go everywhere. Anyway, we was that skin, we were uh, we starving. And uh, we all come being to practice one day. And we decided, I said, no, go to Morrison's on the way home. And they used to go with Morrison's and fill a shopping trolley up with food and just walk out with it, you know what I mean? And on the way to the car, I don't know why they never stopped me at this hour. It might be because I've looked a bit mad, you know what I mean? So I threw all this food in the boot, but the security fella got uh, Paul's number, horse's number, and uh, and next minute there's a phone call saying that, you know, he's got to go to the police station and all that. And that's when I knew that, you know, we, we did this bond forever because obviously he never grasped me up and he came up with some... Uh, 
know, help lad this story, who I, why I was in the car with him. And back in those days, Mark was only just beginning to twig what the band were up to when his back was turned. I was more of a beer monster and they, they disappeared and I wondered why they're coming back happy, what they're doing. I was smoking weed, weren't they? Didn't tell me about it. I think what, but why we did drugs is to get over the nerves. Because, we, I mean, I know Paul was very nervous. Um, we, we, and it was just a way of, oh, I couldn't give a fuck, let's get pissed, stoned, whatever, and just play and just enjoy ourselves. Don't care what them lot think out there. <laughs> and they saw that, everybody saw that, that we were just enjoying ourselves and we, re we really didn't, well, if it ends tomorrow, it ends tomorrow, we'll just go out for a blast, you know what I mean? I mean, apart from bears buzzing about and tripping over my wires and causing mayhem, uh, apart from that, I've nothing to worry about. <laughs> the audience age seems to have evolved. Great seeing youngsters at the front. Youngsters. How Great do, seeing young people. How do you think they've heard about you? Parents. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Although if you ask our kid, it's because he's on Gogglebox. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes there's, a, there's an ingredient that's unquantifiable uh, when it comes to musicians and the magic they can create just from simply being in a room together, you know. Uh, no one's been to no music school, everyone's flying by the seat of the pants, you know. You, you, you really are inventing the rules as you go along in, in, in many ways. And I think the Mondays on the Roses have both had a, a modicum of that going on. Well, it might be. It might be, it could be. It could possibly. be. Possibly. Have you watched any of him on Gogglebox? I've not seen any of it. Why not? I don't know, get it over here. All right, okay, but you've seen him on some of his TV things. Um, I saw bits of him on YouTube when he was in the jungle. Well, that was 10 years ago. I remember that, yeah. You were pretty obsessed with watching him. You enjoyed that. And you were proud yeah. of him as well. Oh, very proud of him, yeah. He did really well. Yeah. Very were you proud. surprised he did so well? Very surprised, yeah. Why, what did you think he would do? I thought he'd last about two days. Yeah? Yeah. What did? What do you remember seeing him doing? Some of them challenges, the food challenges, where he ate the bugs and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, he wow. just went straight for it. Yeah. What do you think of him doing all this TV stuff, like all the quiz shows and the UFO show he did? Um... I don't think about him doing it. God, he doesn't have to do so many. Mm. No, he'll do anything, won't he? I always thought the Mondays missed a trick, right? And this might be because of who I am. I always thought, you, I, I listened to that first album and I think there's something really, really innovative and different there. And then we got Pills and Thrills and that was like a DJ's album. Oak and Fold. Yeah. And I always thought the Mondays, and a lot of it down to Sean and Bez, ended up being sort of like clowns. And, you know, they would play up, you know, swear on TV, go on, do a TFI Friday, and it would be funny because Sean would come on and he'd try to contain himself not swearing. And they became like a music hall act which I don't think Paul would have been over the moon about. I've got to be honest with you, I hated that. I thought they sold themselves short. And if they had been able to concentrate musically and develop musically, they could have been a different type of band. Not like a U2 or something like that, even though I'm not a U2 fan. But you know what I mean? And yeah. I suspect Paul wouldn't have wanted that. You know, because he didn't want to clown about. He wanted to be a professional uh, musician. But do you not think it's good for the band, fundamentally? Yeah, it's definitely good for the band. Yeah. Yeah. And Bez has become a bit of a star in his own right as well. I think Bez comes across better on TV yeah. than Sean does. Yeah. Did you see him on Dancing on Ice? Only what was on YouTube. What did you think? I thought it was great. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think he managed to manages to be so likeable? <sighs> he is likeable. Yeah. He's, he's very loyal, Bez. Yeah. Very loyal character. Mm -hmm. Very honest. Mm -hmm. And I think that's um, part of his charm.
Bez was just a fan. Let's yeah, get he got that up straight. and danced, didn't and he? And he got up and danced into mm. a few gigs. And it was such a, um, a success, shall we say. Yeah. But that's why they got him. You know, and, and, and he is. He's got a good personality, Bez, and I'd never say anything against him. You know, he's done very well. Um, and promoted the band in the right way. I'm not too sure how keen everyone else was surrounding me because like, this is like a one-off, you know what I mean? And he worked, and it was actually uh, Tony Wilson who said that I should join the band because I think he reminded me a, lo a little bit of Ian Curtis, you know, because he used to fucking do all that mad sort of uh, freaky sort of dancing. And it was like Tony who kind of pushed... Uh, Pushed that they did make no into the band more than the band did actually. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah, then I, I was, and I've been on stage ever since, obviously. We never quite reached the dizzy heights that we imagined for ourselves. We wanted to be like, you know, the biggest rock and roll band in the world, you know what I mean? Like, you know, legendary status, rock and roll, like, you no. Know, we lived a rock and roll lifestyle, but we never like, quite managed to you know, get that world like uh, recognition. We 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 were uh, young, we had fucking dreams, we were, we was having great times, great parties, all really enjoying ourselves. And of course I uh, in the early days before we could afford uh, you know to have our own hotel room, me and me and all used to share rooms together as well. So we, we, we spent, we, we travelled the world, shared rooms together as well. Uh, and I could tell you a few stories, but I, I better not. <laughs> I mean, he's got a kind of reputation of, of still of being a, a complete caner. Like, do you think that's... He still is a complete caner. How does he manage to look so healthy, though? Because when he's not on stage, he's working out. Yeah. And he lives in the country. And he does a lot of juicing and he's really juicing. into his health, isn't he? Yeah, and he's uh, distilled water. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's convinced that gets rid of his grey hair. What, distilled water? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Mm. Have you ever tried it? No, yeah. <laughs> I drink the tap water over here. It's like, that's 90% recycled piss, isn't it? Do you not, do you not have a water filter? Yeah. Easier oh. to get it out the tap. Right, so then it's not... Oh, not in the house is what no. I feel. We have a separate unit that you... Like a jug thing. Right. So obviously without giving away the exact location of where you live, like, tell me about where you live. I live um, 25 miles away from Palm Springs on the edge of uh, Joshua Tree National Park. Wow, what's that like? Very, very quiet. Mm-hmm. Very quiet indeed. Mm. That's where I like to spend my time. Yeah. Doing not much. So you sound like you've had a, a complete reboot of your life, really. Oh, um, I have, yeah. Really rebooted. Yeah. I, I couldn't sit still for many years. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't like to stay at home. I had to be out doing something. Mm -hmm. and, and when I was youthful, I had to be out at a club. Yeah. Or, or, or some music venue. Mm -hmm. I had to be out for like six days a week. And what do you think initiated the change? Oh, God, I've slowed down. <laughs> By choice or...? Just naturally. Yeah. So, about three years ago, you uh, earned a new title in your life of being a granddad. Oh, yes. <laughs> you weren't very happy about... You were very happy about having a grandchild, but you weren't happy about the name yeah, Grandad, were I you? Didn't, I didn't want to be Grandad. I really didn't want to be Grandad. Absolutely oh. over the moon, yeah. but I didn't. it wasn't being called Grandad. But I am now used to it. Right, so at the beginning, they, they used to call you a different word, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. So, because... Lila's other granddad in Arabic is Gidu. He fancied being called Gidu. I have two granddaughters, Lila and Bridget. And Lila is the oldest. She's now at school and her father is Egyptian. And um, Gidu is a, is a word for granddad mm -hmm. in Egypt. So I was Gidu for a while. 
Then one day, Lila was crying and we said, what's the matter? She said, I've not got a granddad and my friends have got a granddad. Oh. So Amelia said to her, of course you've got a granddad. She said, Paul's your granddad. Oh, but you call him Giddo, like uh. you call your other granddad Giddo. Yeah. So she said, but I don't want to Giddo, so no. I want a granddad. <laughs> oh. So Paul oh. said, you've got a granddad. So yeah. ever oh. since then, it was all right, because yeah. she knew she wanted a granddad. And I've been granddad ever since. Aww. And then it was all granddad, granddad, granddad. And now do you, do you not mind the title? No, I love it. And even the other day, she said to me, Does everybody get upset because granddad's not here? Because I do. And what's Bridget like as a baby? She's still baby, baby. Just yeah. sleeping all the time, so yeah. I get to see her next week. I have not seen her for a couple of months. So you're quite fortunate, really, in that your job with the band takes you back to England a lot, so you can keep in touch with your family. At least seven times a year. Wow. For, for different lengths of, uh, of time. And do you still hold a candle to Manchester because it's where, you, where you're from and where everything was born? Yeah, of course I do. It's Manchester. It's a great place to be born. Yeah. Yeah, so I've got two granddaughters. And uh, when you first asked me to do this podcast thing, it was like, no, no thanks. It's not really me. I don't really like being interviewed and stuff like that. But then I thought, what about the granddaughters? You know, they're, they're, maybe they want to listen back to Grandad in 20 years' time. <laughs> no, and this podcast will still be floating around, hopefully. Yeah. So uh, one of the reasons I'm doing it is for, the, for them to. Yeah. So they can find out who Grandad was. But also as well, I think, to redress some of the myths. Oh, yeah. Definitely wanted to do that, which I think I've done. I mean, if anyone's got any questions, please... Uh, yeah. Get them to me and I'll put the myth right. Yeah. Well, obviously we're going to carry on, even though we've kind of virtually brought it up to present day, we're going to carry on doing this podcast. Mm -hmm. And so any questions are really welcome, aren't they? Yeah. And there are some myths still to be busted. But, you know, it's important to set the record straight, isn't it? Yeah, I wanted to say it. It's been 40 years. Let's let's have the truth. Right. You know? Yeah. Very brave of you, though, to do that as well. Yeah, well, the truth will set you free. Yeah, and, and even when the truth isn't really particularly pretty, mm -hmm. at least it's the truth, yeah. and, and there's not like lies floating round about you, Yeah, which true. there have been a lot of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the last thing, well, two more things we need to talk about. Number one is, where are we up to right now with in terms of the Mondays and... Any plans? I mean, you've got some tours coming up, but any plans to actually release any new material? Do you still have an aspiration to um, do that? I'd love to release a new album. It's just whether me and Sean are getting on well enough to work together. Mm. Are you willing to actually put out an olive branch to make that happen? Uh, wow, I've given him an olive tree. <laughs> More than once. Yeah. Never mind a branch. I've given him a tree on a few occasions and he's not taken it so you know i don't know where he's up to do you think he will possibly yeah it's quite possible never say never we can all live in hope can't we yeah do you yeah. think you've all still got it in you to create new stuff oh god yeah definitely mm -hmm. definitely we're playing better than ever yeah you know the, our show is a really good tight band yeah and, and sean's singing better than ever and do you actually enjoy performing now? Yeah, I don't puke up before I go on stage anymore. <laughs> Musically, they never really developed. They got overtaken by fame and by the Manchester scene and dance music and the drugs um, and, you know, people making money. I mean, you know, Bez was in the Sunday Times this week, you know, where he goes on holiday, right? Um, you know, you know, all this I'm a celebrity getting me out of stuff I'd never watch. 
goggle box and stuff. People say it's brilliant. I've never watched it. You know, I don't like seeing people I had very, very high regard for as musicians and innovators becoming clowns, basically. Sean won't like me saying that, but I think that's basically it. I think times have changed and I think now you kind of have to. I think people like Tony Wilson's ideas of things or Bob Dylan these days, you wouldn't get a sniffing. Times have changed and I think you've got, you, you do what you've got to do. And I think there was, there was a bit of friction between me and Paul with, I mean, me and Paul, friction between me and Paul versus Sean because Sean probably felt like me and Paul felt like that. And we probably did back then. We kind of got used to it and kind of warmed and warmed to it and, got, and accept it now. But we were kind of very old fashioned in the way of, you know, keep it rock and roll and it should be about the music and about the art and Sean, and Sean was like, don't be naive, times have changed and no one's wrong. You know, I think it's just different. Well, I'm doing my own stuff, I want to still do it the old way and it'll probably be, do, be to my de detriment. But I know that uh, it's Paul on my shoulder all the time, you know, don't make a dick of yourself. I think they sold themselves short. And maybe it's the way of working class lads. Maybe working class lads do that. You know, you look at, uh, um, you look at Oasis and you look at Blur and you know which groups are working class lads, don't you really? Okay, so the other things that we have to talk about, things coming up in the future. Mm -hmm. Number one is, of course, this podcast, which obviously by now everybody knows about. Mm -hmm. But also there's a book in the works. Yeah. Tell us about that. A book of the podcast. Yeah, well, it's kind of... Maybe going into a little bit more nitty-gritty. Yeah. Um, but there will be a book. And the other project that you're doing in collaboration with Gaz is a movie. Is the movie. <laughs> the movie. <laughs> Tell Lo us loosely based on some of the Mondays stories. What kind of inspired by? Okay, inspired by. Um, so it's about a Manchester band who existed 20 years ago. 25 years 25 ago. 25 years ago. And they're offered this uh, great chance to get back together. Right. With, um, but with an uh, unsavoury type manager. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's not exactly the story of the Mondays. It's just a comedy drama mm -hmm. inspired by yours and Gaz's experience of being in the Mondays. But yeah. that's where the similarity kind of ends, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll keep it at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you and Gaz have been brilliant. Yeah, we... um, sharing some ideas for anecdotes and stories, and mm -hmm. uh, you'll also have cameo roles in the film, won't you? Oh yeah. Yeah, and Definitely. it won't be a drug dealer this time. You always get typecast as a drug dealer. I know, I've been always a drug dealer. Yeah. I wonder why that is. Mmm, funny that. <laughs> <laughs> And Paul and Gaz aren't the only ones who are going to have cameo roles in the movie. When we end up doing the movie, would you two like to be in it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a joke. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, Angela. <laughs> It'd have to, have to have an X rating. <laughs> Hey, but it won't be your it won't be your screen debut, will it? Because you've already been in a you've already been in another of our productions, haven't you? Oh, oh do you remember yes. That? Oh God, have you seen it on? It's on YouTube, Sandra. Yes, Linda and Sandra, along with their friend Kathleen, appeared as extras in a show that my company made called Con Men Case Files, where they played the parts of victims of a fake psychic in our old kitchen in Manchester. Have a look at this. Despite the far-fetched fictitious origins of Paul Williams' alleged psychic gift, his career as a psychic funded a glamorous, opulent lifestyle. I remember that, I remember that. Didn't we have a laugh? Mm. Want it a laugh? Oh, God. So the film um, is in development right now mm -hmm. and there's some financing attached. So um, in the next, uh, I would say, probably 18 months to two years, you should be uh, seeing. Seeing, <laughs> seeing and hearing about it. Yeah, OK. OK, great. Brilliant. Well, we're going to play another track. Mm. Thanks. Right. Yep. Thank you for being okay. amazing. Sunday morning. <laughs> you should have been at church. Well, you can do that next week, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. 12 days after this recording was made.
Paul was dead. Can we go back to the the horrible day when uh, when he died? Can you talk talk about what happened that day? Yeah. Um. Well, the, you sure you want this? Um. We did, got a gig, um, the day before we did a rehearsal. Paul Kerr turned up with his daughter, Amelia. He didn't look too good, but he was saying he'd had a um, COVID jab and he thinks it's affected his hearing. So he couldn't play, which was very unusual because you normally, you know, he tried, but he just couldn't play. So it was obviously there was a, a, a problem there. And the last thing I said to Paul was, see how you are in the morning and if it's you know if you're not an improvement go and see a doctor well the next thing you get a phone call in the morning me rang me up and says um she sounded very stressed and emotional and i said to jane do you want is, is it paul you might need to go to the hospital so when i got there he was just on the couch just pale he'd been dead for a while mark and his wife jane tried mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on paul as the rest of the band gathered in shock at Paul's mum's house. Then the paramedics came in and they just looked and said, no, he's been gone for a while, you know. But it's not not the thing I wanted to see, really, you know. That well, must have been hugely traumatic for you. And that, it was, because, you know, it's just, you know, um, and then it got a bit worse. He's not the most emotional of people. And he was absolutely beside himself. And I went, and when I got out to London, he was just bawling his head out. And he said, and he had an argument with Sean and him, and, and, and he said, I just can't cope. I've got to, I've got to go. And he said, but I don't want to leave him. And I've never seen Mark like that, ever, ever. Sean was saying we should still do the gig at some point as well. And I was like, I can't, I can't even get on the bus. I can't travel anywhere today without him being there. It's just impossible. People were uh, ringing, asking, um, could you do the gig? Sean wants to do the gig, which is just mad. Um, I didn't understand that. And he was having a go at Mark Day. Um, it's, not, it's not up to you, it's up to her, talking about his mum, when I got there. Do we do the gig or not, you know? <clears throat> no, he's on the floor, he's, he's, he's dead, he's on the floor. We're not doing a gig, you know, fans are no fans. It's not, it's not happening. And even... The first gig we did in Scotland without without us, without Paul, and we was driving home, and Mark just leaned over to me and said, we're going to be home on time. And I went, I know, he went, it's not the same without stopping every 30 minutes for Paul to have a cig and you have a piss. <laughs> so I have a piss every 30 minutes and she has a cig. And he said, and he just looked at me, and Mrs. Mark, and tears rolling down his eyes, he just put his head on my shoulder, and we both just started, I know we're going all Hollywood, but we both just started tears through now. I think he just really, and you know what, and Rowetta as well. She took it really bad, and she's been really good on the stage. Every gig she's mentioned him, every gig, every gig. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it, you know what I mean? And I uh, rushed right down to the house, you know what I mean? And he was still laying in the, the front room. Mark had tried and done some mouth-to-mouth -mouth on him. And, uh, yeah, that was so shocking to see one of your best mates who you've spent, uh, no, late lay there dead, and uh, I'll, ne I'll never forget, you know, his face. No, I mean, because he looked really angry to me because he, he looked like he didn't, it wasn't his time to go. And then my dad died about five hours later as well, which was a great, like it was double, double death in one day. We tried to make Paul's funeral the send off that he would have wanted. The music playing as his coffin was being carried into the church. If you had to pick one Manchester track that you would be your go-to. Right? What's your kind of favourite seminal Manchester track? Ooh. Ooh. It will probably be a New Order song. Yeah. And probably Ceremony. Ceremony, you said yeah. that before, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Ceremony was the song that we played as his coffin was being carried by his three sons and Sean, Gaz and his childhood friend Carl into the church. And we had two people who were singing. I've been playing the Echo and the Bunny Men on repeat for yeah. the last three months when I drive. It's weird. I've Love just the Bunny really Men. I've discovered them again. Loved, I saw them last year. They were playing the same festival as the Mondays. Yeah. And um, it was great. I stood at the side of the stage and, and watched the Bunny Men. 
Nice. Incredible. Yeah, Ian yeah, McCulloch yeah. still got it. Yeah, Gaz said to him, best band in the world, and McCulloch turned around and said, I know. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> Playing Nothing Lasts Forever was the man himself, Ian McCulloch, the singer from Echo and the Bunny Men. And Rowetta made sure that there wasn't a dry eye in the house when she sang Bridge Over Troubled Water, but she found it really, really difficult. I'm not doing any more, that's what I've said, that's it now. It's, oh, it's, it was just a blur. I love, well, I hate singing, I hate the idea of funerals. So it was just awful, but, but very proud as well, because, you know, I do, I do I feel like I'm family in a way. I've known them for so long, all the oh, children, yeah. everybody. So, yeah, and, um, yeah, it was just, it was just, it's just horrible, isn't it? Yeah. And it's just, the, it's just the kids. It was such a shock, as you know. But, um, oh... We just all miss him so much, obviously. There were some really moving speeches, including one by Paul's dear friend, Ian Brown. And the music playing as his coffin was being carried out of the church. Eight years old, and David Bowie comes on, doing Starman with a big blue acoustic guitar. I'd never seen a blue guitar before in my life. And then he looked like he'd stepped out of another world. And it was like, my life changed at that moment. Yeah, it was Starman by David Bowie. But the really weird thing is that I had no idea that a few years before, Paul had told his friend Jason that those three songs are exactly what he would have wanted at his funeral. When we was working out in France in 2006, morbid as we were, we'd often speak about, you know, if I die, will you come to my funeral? If, you know, you die first, will I come to your funeral? And I was like... Yeah, of course I'll come to your funeral. I was like, would you come to mine? He went, nah, nah, couldn't be asked. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's great. And then we'd speak about what songs we'd have played at our funeral, you know, and he'd said to me that without question, it would be Ceremony by New Order, which we both thought was a poignant and great choice. And then it was Starman. And he also said that he'd like Echo and the Bunny Men. And of course, um, Ian got to sing the song at Paul's funeral, which the music that day just, you know, like I said, walking into the church and ceremony was playing. I just took me back to that day when we was on that patio thinking, I never thought this would happen. And here we are. Yeah. Um, well, I remember when, on the day of the funeral, I remember thinking it was going to be really hard seeing Sonny and Chico carrying the coffin. And we got down and they picked the coffin up and we were walking along into the church. I thought, oh, I can do this. This is okay. Right. I can do this. And then I heard ceremony start and I was like, oh. (laughs) As funerals go, we think it's exactly what Paul would have loved. There was apparently even some naughty behaviour going on. I'll tell you one thing that happened at the funeral that was fucking amazing, right? Uh, I bumped into outside now there was only one toilet at the funeral right and it was a long service yeah which was wonderful it doesn't bother me in one iota but of course all those old blokes needed a piss didn't they (laughs) (laughs) so anyway at the end as everybody was coming out there was a big queue for the toilet okay at the head of the queue was the priest (laughs) waiting to go in so anyway i'm stood there with and and says to do you want a line? Do you want, are you coming to the bog, okay? Because, I mean, I've not done drugs for 18 years. So I said, no, mate, you go on your own. And my abiding memory of that is watching and push the priest out of the way when they went in the toilet to have a fucking line at Paul Ryder's funeral. Right? And I just thought, my God, Manchester, what a place. I'm sure Hooky was just simply mistaken and they were just both desperate to pee, right? We're playing out with Paul's favourite big arm track and that is Love Is. So we're almost at the end of this phase of the series where Paul and I are the main interview spine of the episodes. 
But we've decided to keep the series going by playing you some more of the extended versions of the interviews with our fab guests. There's such brilliant material that we didn't get to use and so many of people have said that they didn't want this to end. So we're calling it season two, the bonus interviews. We'll continue next week with everyone's favourites. Yes, the rock and roll mums, Linda and Sandra will be doing the whole show next time and there's also a few more bits and pieces of Paul that we've saved as well as a lot of home video footage that we've not used so you will see more of him popping up from time to time as the weeks unfold in these bonus episodes so please come back next week and join us thank you all for making this a consistently chart topping show both in the uk and ireland and in loads of other foreign countries as well i know we've we've been in the charts in something like 25 different countries um paul would have been absolutely blown away i know and i'm sure he's listening watching from up there Please stay connected with us via our website, paulrider.tv, where you'll find our socials and our shop. Have a brilliant week. See you next week. Please come back, same time, same place.
I'm living Some of these things I don't like giving Glistening Productions <laughs> He was always the same throughout his life, fame, fortune. He was always the same guy. Oh, with no airs and graces, no pretensions. He was a wonderful yeah. guy. Miss him so much.